Hello and welcome to our presentation on cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is an umbrella term kind of analogous to the word stroke. To say that someone had a stroke or to say that someone has cerebral palsy indicates very little about their deficits, presentation, level of function, or prognosis. In fact, cerebral palsy is an even broader term than stroke. While stroke describes a brain injury that occurs due to too much or too little blood in the area of the brain, in an area of the brain, cerebral palsy describes the results of many types of brain injury, including hemorrhage, hypoxic injury, infection, genetic developmental issues, or traumatic injury. What brings all these injuries together under the cerebral palsy umbrella is that they occur in utero or in the first few years of a child's life. The majority of cerebral palsy is caused by an infection during gestation. Gestation. First trimester injuries tend to cause brain development issues and maldevelopments. Patients with these issues tend to have severe body-wide deficits and may also present with comorbidities such as epilepsy and cognitive impairments. Injuries that occur during the second trimester tend to be injuries to the periventricular white matter of the brain. That is the white matter that lines the outside of the lateral ventricles. The blood flow to this area is vulnerable to hypoxia, infection, and hypotension. When these occur, blood flow to the area suffers similar to what occurs in a watershed stroke. The area may also be affected by hemorrhage. The motor nerve fibers controlling the leg pass very near this periventricular area, so these injuries often result in spasticity affecting the leg because of damage to these upper motor neurons. Later in pregnancy, injuries tend to be to gray matter, either in the cortex or deeper in the brain, particularly in the basal ganglia, which is an area of high metabolic activity during this stage of development. In addition, strokes may occur near birth. Because of connections between veins and arteries that are present in fetal circulation, thrombi that develop in veins may enter arteries and result in hypoperfusion stroke, often in the territory of the middle cerebral artery. This results, unsurprisingly, in unilateral deficits involving the upper extremity, similar to what would result in an MCA stroke in an adult. Around 10% of cerebral palsy cases result from hypoxic injury during birth. Finally, around 10% of cerebral palsy cases result from injury occurring after birth. Most studies use a cutoff of around five years of age, um, though some use two years, um, and there seems to be a little bit of disagreement in the literature with regards to the cutoff for brain injury to result in a cerebral palsy diagnosis. Uh, the source of a postnatal injury uh, may be infection, stroke, uh, trauma, or hypoglycemia. So basically, cerebral palsy does not refer to a specific neuropathophysiology, but rather is an umbrella term to describe the clinical presentation of patients who experienced an injury to the developing brain before or during birth or in the first few years of life. Cerebral palsy is a non-progressive brain injury that generally presents with slow motor development, hypertonicity, loss of motor control that can result in involuntary motions. The three major subtypes of cerebral palsy is ataxic, dyskinetic, and spastic. Ataxic cerebral palsy is in about 5% of individuals with cerebral palsy. They present with generalized hypotonia with loss of muscle coordination due to damage of the cerebellum. Ataxic means without order. These individuals usually present with difficulties in balance, clumsiness, instability, and sometimes slow eye movements due to the cerebellum being damaged. About 7% of individuals with cerebral, cerebral palsy fall under the dyskinetic subtype. As these individuals attempt to move, they have uncontrolled involuntary motions due to part of the basal ganglia being damaged. This subtype can be separated into two different patient categories, hypotonia and hypertonia. The most common type of cerebral palsy is spastic, which accounts for 85% to 90% of individuals with cerebral palsy. Within the spastic subtype, they can present with unilateral or bilateral symptoms. These signs and symptoms in this subtype is due to damage in the motor cortex during or after birth. The major signs and symptoms of these individuals are unusual posture, difficulties in gait, speech, and eating, which may be due to hypertonicity, increased in tone, and hyperreflexia. The major signs and symptoms, the minor signs and symptoms, 
are teeth grinding, delayed growth, constipation, hearing impairments. These individuals may also have some loss of sensation and perception with some deficits in cognition. One of the standardized tests for CP is the gross motor function measure, which evaluates the changes in motor function over time. It is often used to assess the effects of any clinical interventions. Another way to classify the severity of movement disability for activities of daily living is to utilize the manual ability classification system, which is a medical classification specifically for children with CP between the ages of four and 18. Other tests and measures that can be used to assess an individual's deficits are any of the upper motor neuron tests we have talked about in this class, such as the Babinski test and deep tendon reflex. Also evaluating range of motion, gait, respiration, postural and mobility test, along with speech and feeding to make sure the individuals are getting proper nutrition. Cerebral palsy is usually diagnosed early on within the first two years of a child's life. The damage in the children's brain could be from some complication with pregnancy, such as mother acquiring an infection or a traumatic brain injury during labor or shortly after birth. Rett syndrome is a genetic mutation affecting brain development, which presents with similar signs and symptoms such as stiff muscles, loss in coordination, and speech difficulties. In order to differentiate between two, the two, a blood test can be used to confirm the presence of the MECP2 mutation. This is a X-linked gene mutation that is present in Rett syndrome and is not in CP. A traumatic brain injury for a child can lead to many functional deficits depending on the severity of the TBI. Children that experience a mild traumatic brain injury can have similar symptoms to a child with cerebral palsy, such as spasticity and motor deficits. But with cerebral palsy, the symptoms will stay with the individual forever, will be non-progressive. Compared to a mild traumatic brain injury, treatment can improve symptoms leading to functional recovery. Ultimately, utilizing a magnetic resonance imaging test can differentiate between the bleeding in the brain for a mild traumatic brain injury compared to actual damage of white matter or a lesion in the brain for cerebral palsy. Overall, the gestation period and the first few years of an infant's life is a critical period. Damage during these periods can result in many different functional deficits for the child. All right, next we're going to talk about some of the pharmacological interventions um, patients with cerebral palsy often use, um, starting with botulinum toxin. Um, typically, botulinum toxin is used in conjunction with physical therapy treatments um, to act as a muscle relaxant for spastic forms of cerebral palsy. Um, it's been shown to improve gait outcome and general prognosis. Like we talked about earlier in the semester, um, it works at the presynaptic terminal to block the release of acetylcholine um, at the neuromuscular junction. This way, the nerve cannot innervate the muscle um, and cause it to contract. Um, a lot of the pharmaceuticals that I'll mention have quite a few um, side effects. So muscle soreness, fatigue, influenza-like symptoms are some of the most common, um, but you'll also see pain, leg cramps, skin rashes, um, excessive weakness, um, sometimes infection with um, botulinum as toxin as well. Next is um, baclofen, and we've also talked about baclofen a little bit during this course. Um, so there's two different ways you can administer baclofen, through pump or through pill. Typically, the pump style um, of administration for baclofen is um, for patients with severe, severe um, spasticity in their limbs. Um, oral baclofen can be administered to a wider variety of patients um, and improve spasticity mildly. Overall, baclofen works to reduce spasticity and can improve passive and active motions for patients. Likewise, baclofen can decrease the resistance to passive range of motion and may reduce painful spasms. Baclofen will work presynaptically and postsynaptically. 
presynaptically baclofen works to decrease calcium conduction, while postsynaptically it will work to stimulate the opening of potassium ion channels, um, which will lead to hyperpolarization. Um, so generally baclofen works to inhibit the release of excitatory neurons at the spinal cord. Um, so side effects for baclofen include sedation, dizziness, weakness, um, sometimes confusion, nausea, hypotension, um, and sometimes hallucinations. And finally, um, another common um, drug used to treat cerebral palsy is tizanidine. Um, tizanidine works systematically as an antispasticity medication. Um, it can reduce, it can work to reduce muscle tone, the frequency of muscle spasms, and hyperreflexia. Um, Tizanidine works at the presynaptic level by reducing the release of the excitatory neurotransmitter glutamate and um, from the presynaptic terminals of the spinal cord. Tizanidine is an alpha-2 adrenergic agonist. It works by decreasing synaptic reflex, act synaptic reflex activities by inhibiting the release of excitatory neurotransmitters. Side effects for tizanidine include sedation, weakness, dizziness. Um, likewise, it can include dozing behaviors, orthostatic hypotension, dry mouth, um, hallucinations. And one important thing with tizanidine is that um, you want to definitely make sure that the patient's liver is functioning properly because it can um, take a toll on the patient's liver. Physical therapy can play an important role in allowing children with cerebral palsy to function normally in their daily lives. In a study done by Morgan et al., they looked at the game theory, which focuses on task-specific intervention for children ages 1 to 3. This intervention was family-focused and showed advanced motor and cognitive outcomes compared to standard care. GAME is for goals, activity, and motor enrichment and looks at the principles of activity motor learning, family-centered care, parent coaching, and environmental enrichment. A second study, study done by Prosser et al. also looked at improving motor function of children ages 1 to 3. In this study, they used a dynamic weight support with motor activity. They promoted motor variability, exploration, and error experiences that characterized the typical development of upright motor skills in walking. Activities included moving between the floor and standing, squatting, walking, climbing, and walking up and down steps, and inclines, and other typical toddler movements. The information learned will be valuable in improving our understanding of how to best optimize the potential of the developing brain to support motor function after an injury. Here's a couple pictures of children using the zero-g gait and balance training system from Artec, which was used by Prosser et al. in their study to help with the dynamic weight support. In a third study done by Van Volpen, they looked at children's ages four to 10, which is a little outside of the neuroplasticity age. Um, this study looked at functional power training, which can be used to improve the walking capacity in children ages 4 to 10. They used functional loaded multi-joint exercises to, to mimic activities most relevant to real life activities that the children would be participating in. These included running and walking with a focus on ankle push-off, high movement velocity, and progressive load. Um, so as although there are not any serious contraindications to therapy. Some contraindications would include if the patient's status will not improve from therapy, if pain is elicited during therapy, or if the patient has been performing therapy but they have plateaued and so they're not making any current gains during therapy. And then here are some reference slides. And thank you for listening to our presentation.